So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Superstition Review guest lecture series. Um, we've got another great guest with us today to talk about um, the role of art, um, art editor and art in the literary world. So um, we've got Paula Isidoric here with us. Hi. Hi. Um, just a little bit about Paula. Um, She's an American artist currently based in Cleveland, Ohio, with exhibits um, throughout the United States. And uh, from her website, Paula looks to contemporary painting and the abundant perfection found in nature for continual inspiration. So, um, and she's been published in Superstition Review before. So we're super excited to get to talk to you today. Yeah, I believe so, that was 2018, episode 21. Does that sound familiar? Yes, yeah. Okay. And then you did that wonderful video for us at, uh, on YouTube that we got so much interest and in, really enjoyed. I am doing this today because when you asked me to do the video, that was so much fun. And, oh, I, and when yeah. Madeline approached me via email, I guess it's been like a month ago now. And she was like, do you want to do a guest lecture? I was like, of course. Everything I've done so far with Superstition Review has been a positive growing experience it, it adds it adds to me as an artist to even create a video like that like that wasn't my normal thing like that was actually you know probably hours of like messing around and yeah. <laughs> so yeah it was it was a wonderful thing to add to um just the experience overall I don't know if all the artists do videos is that something that most of them do mm -hmm. no just some weirdo in Cleveland <laughs> <laughs> like I'll make a video <laughs> I use it though as an example when I'm when I'm soliciting guest posts and ideas. So I always send them to your uh, your video. I just love it. Why? Thank you. Yeah, like I said, it was it was a learning experience and it gave me confidence because I had never done anything like that before. And I do document my work as I go, so it was fun to show like in little snippets the buildup of um, how my process is expressed visually because again I can talk about it all day long but I think most people need visual aids to understand when you work with wood grain for example there's a there's a our map already laid out for me as an artist that I can you know work with and um, I've currently moved away from like the organic wood grain as my pattern um, kind of collaborative uh, composition and I've done more of the markings happen organically through like a lot of physical gestures. Mm. So I'm still doing that style in my opinion, but it's way looser now. Mm. The wood grain was um, that kind of chapter of my work um, kind of evolved to the more process, more material-based nice. items that I do today. All right, so um, going along with that, based on what you've said so far about the evolution of your art. Um, would you like to explain a bit more about what do you create and how do you go about creating it? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how many of you have been involved in improv before. But improv has this mantra that's called yes and. Maybe they don't even call it a mantra, but it's called yes and. And that's a lot of my creative process. A lot of my creative process is approaching a surface and discovering the yes and building from there. So um, like the piece behind me, I don't know how much that gets seen, but I didn't know when I was working on this piece that it would ever turn out like this. Like a lot of artists I know, and I'm sure even in your profession, a lot of people are really rigid and pre-planned and they, and they almost have like a structure they're, they're creating within. As an artist, I'm very free form. And um, I love that. I love the happy surprises. So one of the things that I do is I surround myself with familiar mat materials. As you can see over my shoulder, I have materials. Um, I've been using a lot of them for decades. Um, so it's not like I'm free forming with new materials because that would be chaotic. Like you literally need to kind of know your tools, but I am free forming with the creative process. So I'm taking what's familiar to me and I'm having a ton of happy accidents and a bunch of yes and. And sometimes I get to a point in a piece where I'm like, I really like this. And then I screw it up. Like I have a piece hanging over on my wall over there that I'm like, okay, I, I destroyed it. Like, and it's not destroyed permanently. It's just destroyed until I have the courage to reapproach it 
and um, play with the surface some more. And one of the things that I've done a lot since the work that was published in um, 2018 with your company is I've done a lot of layering. I've taken a lot of risk on the surface where I do stop and have something that I like a lot. Like I'll get to a point, I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. And people will even come by my studio and be like, oh, that's awesome. And then I sand it off and I punch it almost with a paintbrush. Like I just get really physically involved. Like um, I'm nothing like Jackson Pollock by any means, but I understand the gestural motions on a really small scale. Cause I, I my pieces, I don't like to work too big because of um, practicality with mm -hmm the size of creating, the size of like the vehicle you have to drive around in and just even being able to lift work. So mm -hmm. the pieces that were featured in um, issue 21 are pretty similar to what I'm working with today. Some of them are smaller and most of those pieces sold by the way. I don't know, I don't know what kind of mojo you guys got going on. But um, yeah, so a lot of those pieces sold. Was that answering the process? I ramble, I'm sorry. You have to keep just wrinkle me back in. No, that sounds great. Um, and congratulations on your pieces selling. That's awesome as well. It, it uh, is. So uh, um, can you tell us more about how you go about displaying or sharing your artwork with publications? Like, do people reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? How do you go about that? I have to be honest. Like, at one point, I was really excited to do that. And it was fun. And I, I know that what I did with Superstition Review was like my my biggest accomplishment in online um, journals. I think I did like two or three more. And then um, I kind of took a break from submitting to uh, online publications for no, nothing, nothing other than I just did. And like a, a lot of times my attention gets diverted. And um, right now, like my focus is I'm launching an e-commerce website as of this week, like it's happening probably today or tomorrow. And I've kind of redirected, but the, the experiences that I had, the way I was submitting in the past was I would seek, I would seek the submissions or if I got on an email list, um, you know, I would respond to an open call. Um, and I usually looked at the, I, I look pretty serious at what the magazine or the literary online publication, how they represented themselves, because that affects how I represent myself. And that was part of the process was saying, that's not where I want to be. And this is where I want to be. So uh, it was pretty selective. And I, I think I did that for like two or three years between like 2015 and maybe 2018. Um, and now I have to admit for the last like 18 months, I haven't been submitting to hardly anything. It's been invite only. And that was one of my goals as an artist. And it's the same with exhibitions. Like I have had that's kind of in a weird way, like less ex exhibitions, but ones where I'm exhibiting more work and, and there's more attention on my work versus one piece in a group show of like 40 pieces or something like that. Yeah. Um, I particularly like how you were talking about um, looking into the magazine to see how they represent themselves, because that's something that we look for in all of our submissions is um, how they would, you know, how they would contribute to all of the other work in within the issue of Superstition Review and within the magazine as a whole. So um, that's great to hear that it's like a two way street, right, of mm -hmm. how the artist um, or the contributor um, feels about the magazine and how, you know, how the relationship goes both ways. Oh, yeah. And I really did look at a lot of issues. And I think I might have followed uh, kind of like your website, you know, for like a few months before I submitted. So yeah, it, it was a choice. Like I chose to submit with your magazine. It wasn't like a, I got to submit for everything I can find. It wasn't like that. It was, it was selected and um, you continue to do great work. I get the emails on a regular basis and it's always a positive thing to arrive in my, um, my box, my little mailbox. So congratulations to the organization. And it, I mean, again, I'm just saying, because it's true. I'm not like trying to be like, score bonus points or anything. It's, I, I really think that the organization does a great job of pairing the artwork, representing it in a professional way. And I have to admit, I don't necessarily read all the writings, but I love that they're both there together. Thank you, we appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, 
And then let's see, going on to our next questions. I forgot to mention before, but I wanted to thank Can. She's our current art editor and she helped me with some of the questions on here. So, and hopefully we'll hear from her later on as well. Um, so when you are submitting your art, like you said, it's a definite choice and you select who you want to submit to. And you know, in the past when you were submitting your art, um, what pieces of artwork um, would you choose to submit and how did you choose them? It's usually what I'm currently working on because there's this societal pressure as a contemporary artist to always be producing work. And as a result of always producing work, you kind of want to reward that work with exposure. Um, I Sometimes it's funny because like my work from like four or five years ago will get people be like, your new work's amazing. I'm like, that work? And like, like that work was produced four or five years ago. You just haven't seen it yet. So I tend to gravitate toward um, the most recent bodies of work, but I never abandon older work as well. And at the time that I was involved in submitting for your literary publication, it definitely was um, pieces that worked really well together. Because I think it was five was, if I remember correctly, like five was the amount you were supposed to submit. And I wanted it to be really cohesive and strong. And those pieces were from a very narrow body of work, meaning like they didn't vary much from piece to piece. Like right now, my current body of work, um, my last studio visit from a gallerist was like, oh, it feels a little bit like schizophrenia in here. And I was like, compliment? Probably not. But um, those pieces, thank you for laughing because it is funny. I, I don't take any of that serious. It's, life is meant to be enjoyed. But so um, yeah, those pieces were selected because I thought they would look very cohesive in print as well as um, on exhibitions. And that, that body of work was super successful. It's almost funny because I've had like younger artists ask me, it's like, well, would you go back in time and reproduce that style of work because it was so successful? And it's almost like a, when I live in the now, like I prefer to do, that work had its time and place. Um, so my current work that I'm um, submitting is like one of the pieces is behind me. And the subject is a little donkey who I call ass. And it's referring to being an artist and like being an ass sometimes in the social world as an artist, because you're always like, look at me, I'm an artist. So um, that work has yet to be really cohesive and well-received and I'm gonna give it some time, but I'm still, I'm still playing around with it. But I've noticed a lot of my older pieces, people have come by for like my studio, like a curator will come by and select work that, I mean, like I'm talking like 10 years ago. So you just never know. I'm, I'm always open, but I focus on the, the most current, I guess is a short answer to your question. All right, yeah. That is super interesting to see um, how people are interested in your work um, over time, you know, how they might value the most recent, or like you said, be interested in what you produced 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. you can't really expect that. Um, so how have literary magazines or other literary publications impacted your work or career as an artist? Well, I, I'm going to go really broad on this question. I'm not going to specifically talk about um, styles like what you're, com what you're uh, producing. Literary magazines and art journals sometimes are very intimidating because there's a lot of art speak and you like art in America. And it's all, it's, it's like so far removed from where I am as an artist that sometimes I'm just like, oh, how would I ever get into art America? You know, and that's okay because there's a level for everybody. And the people who are reading art in America are gonna be looking for different work than maybe the spontaneous, like haphazard, like creative expressions that I produce. And um, so, I would say something that's obtainable, like a local magazine, like in Ohio, we have Can Journal, C-A-N. Um, I think it's Contemporary Art Network. I don't know what the N stands for, uh, maybe news, but that's like our local journal and that one's quarterly. And that's something when I pick it up, like I see familiar faces. And so it's, it's a sense of home and it's a sense of like obtainable. So I think it just depends for me personally, whether I want to go into more of a, um, like a high-end literary magazine, something local, which might, the language is still just as good. I mean, the quality is still, still even with the online um, magazines that I've stumbled upon. I would say um, 
overall, it's it's kind of like a visit. Like I visit them. I, I, I'm not a religious subscriber who like, you know, relies on the materials in there. So uh, it can be like a form of entertainment in a way, like um, just kind of like a little visit, like, oh, what's going on with this, you know, literary publication. And um, I always have more desire to get involved than I actually probably pursue. Um, I like how you mentioned the, um, the sense of community, um, especially within your local um, magazines and mm -hmm. the sense of community is definitely a great part of the literary world. Something that I think that me and the other interns and trainees have been learning along the way with our experience here is that you do see those familiar faces and names and things like that, which is always awesome. Um, and then let's see, um, will you tell us more about your journey as an artist and how your art has evolved over time? Oh, thank you. That's, that's an epic question to answer. Um, so my journey as an artist, it, it's funny because a lot of, a lot of my friends are, we're all at this certain age level. I, I, I um, have to admit we're hitting the big five oh, most of us. Um, and so we've been artists for a long time is what I'm referring to. And there's ebbs and flows. There's times where like the community is the most important thing and I, I'm 100% involved and the artwork, um, is, it, it, always, it always reflects kind of what I see or what I'm processing. And currently I've completely abandoned looking to other artists and I'm just going internally with a meditation and um, more adapting to what I see in nature, but not like copying nature, like, oh, I have to go home and paint that flower, more just like, Nature is infinitely creative and, and just non-judgmental upon itself. So I've been the most inspired by that. So my journey started off probably like most artists, you know, going to art school, um, learning from the, the past, which tends to be a ton of white males. And I noticed we have, you know, lots of diversity going on in our community today. And I haven't taken an art history class or a contemporary art class um, in an educational setting in a long time. But um, I would imagine it's changed a little bit, but there was a lot of like never feeling good enough when you're in the educational environment because everybody that was being celebrated was a man. And I'm not, I'm not like a crazy pro liber or anything like that. I would just noticed back then I never, I never felt strong enough. And I would say it's taken decades to not care about that and to really create based on how I feel. So my journey has always been one of optimism and one of never giving up. And I do redefine myself, not because I didn't like where I was prior, but just because I believe in evolving as an artist. I actually kind of am in, in, like, am perplexed by artists that can paint the same thing for decades. I'm like, oh, how, how did your brain do that? Like, I mean, can, can literary people just write the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? I guess, I mean, I don't know. But as an artist, um, my journey definitely includes uh, just a lot of inspiration from what's going on around me and a lot of choice. There's a lot of choice in my journey. Like I, I'm not um, limited in it. I, I believe in exploring, I mean, even like reaching out during the time that I was submitting to the online literary publications. Like that was, that was a new experience for me. I didn't know that I'd ever be selected <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I, I had no idea um, that somebody would be like, hey, we like these paintings and we'll put them together for you and, and pair them up very nicely and honor, honor your work. So, um, and over time, I think accessibility has been kind of the journey too. Like just trying to always have the work accessible to new collectors or people who have never collected before and taking down that big giant facade that art is for an elite group of people. And um, I would say accessibility has been like my theme for the last 18 months, not as what I'm producing the work to look like, but how I'm reaching out to other people, just really wanting to have it available to everyone. And um, even at a price point, I've been doing this fun little project that I call um, the collection and it's art cards and they're small. They're like about that big. And um, they're original paintings, but they get 
selected at random and are mailed to you like in a subscription plan. So that's what my website's launching next is this subscription plan. And I've just been thinking about accessibility, even as like doing stickers, like something fun. I'm like, I snowboard. I don't know. You guys probably have something you do that you want to put a sticker on. So I'm just like, I'll make some stickers. So just, just kind of keeping, I'm not relevant and I know I'm not relevant and I'm okay with that, but just keeping a little bit more accessible accessibility, like keeping it. So like, Oh, maybe somebody never wants to own a painting, but they love art and they wouldn't mind having a small little sticker representing art on their whatever places that they stick their sticker. Hopefully not their car, but it can go on their car too. <laughs> uh, one thing that you said that stood out, really stood out to me was that your journey has been one of optimism, um, which is really great to hear. And then um, regarding art being, um, you know, seeming like it's for an elite group of people. I feel like that's something that um, we kind of want to work on uh, with including art in our magazine, because um, of course there's the literary expectation that you come to a magazine to read the writing and everything. But I think that also having art on uh, in our issues is a way to expose more people to more um, visual artwork. So um, I really appreciate that that's a part of our uh, mission and like vision for things. So I hope that that helps with bringing art to more people. Um, and those were all of the questions that I had prepared. Thank you so much, Paula. You're um, welcome. Yeah, so now we'd like to open it up to the audience. Everybody is welcome to um, either unmute and ask a question or you can send it in the chat. Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Paula, for coming. Um, I had such a good time looking at your website. Um, it was one of the uh, more organized and really visually attractive websites. And I thank love you. looking at your videos too. <laughs> um, so my question is, you talked a bit about um, striving for cohesiveness in your collections. And that's also something that we look for when we curate art, that um, the pieces that are sent in are you know, uh, of the same medium, um, they are similar themes, they're not too repetitive, but they have to have some kind of cohesiveness. So um, when you're making, you know, iterations um, of a certain piece for a series of, or a collection, how do you avoid being repetitive? Well, it's, it's interesting that you're asking me that because there was a period of time when the repetition was the theme of the series. Like if you were on the website, it was the home series. And then the series before that was called Olo. Those ones, Olo varied a lot because I worked with the wood grain, but like the home series and cloudscapes, those were very repetitive. And I needed to get that out at the time because my original, um, I didn't mention this when I talked about my journey, but my original passion was printmaking. So that kind of appears sometimes in the repetition. And, um, but, but the more recent work, which has been about exploring materials, it, it's, it does have a lot of diversity in it. Like right now, um, for example, the edges of my work have become an extension of the painting intentionally. And that has a lot to do with um, work is made by machines now. I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but you can go into um, like a home goods store and you can buy a painting that has texture painted on it by a machine. And I'll get friends, they'll be like, what do you think of my new piece? And I'm like, oh, I wanna die. I'm like, I hate it. Like get some original art, you know? So I have um, like the last couple of themes in, in iterations of the, my work have been to really express surface texture that cannot be duplicated by a computer or a printer in a big giant warehouse somewhere. Um, so that's caused a lot of diversity in the work, but I still feel like it's really cohesive because one, I know how to pair my work together. Like I just do, cause I'm, I'm, I've been around forever. So like, if, if you were to say like, I need, you know, your new pieces, they were, they're really, really diverse, but pick out five that would set really well together on the, on a wall or display of some sort, I'm able to kind of navigate that because there is enough repetition in the diversity of the work. Um, did that answer your question? Totally. Sort of. yeah, yeah, it did. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I love when you said um, about, you know, trying to create artwork that um, with textures that machines can't replicate. I think that's really important. 
uh, whenever I try to search up uh, artwork for like my own home, um, I, I often see like the machine created ones and it's a bit harder to find the original artwork. So um, I appreciate artists like you continuing to uh, challenge the uh, modern uh, trend. Thank you. Any other questions, Patrick, Trish? Um, I think that one of the things that would be great for our trainees to know, um, because they'll be watching this lecture, is um, what, could you talk a little bit about how you, um, I, I struggle with words here because when Ken and I and our faculty advisor meet, we look at the art in terms of craft, composition, and um, what's the third thing? <laughs> Content. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> That's okay. That makes sense. Those are those are three good C's. So that makes sense. Three C's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, for instance, with this session, um, with this submission session in August, we got 45 submissions, which was pretty good. Um, and when we evaluate the pieces, that's what we're looking at. We, we want pieces that show that there is artistry. We want pieces that are well composed. And we also like to see content that is varied across our artists we we don't we get a lot of portraiture or <laughs> maybe we'll get for a long time we were getting a lot of um you know photography of uh ruins uh, or oh interesting yeah. so there was like a trend in that a little trend in that yeah um what advice would you give to uh someone who is curating art for a magazine and um trying to apply those lenses to an artist's work? Well, I don't know if this falls into how you are allowed to look for work, but I would look at um, the local gallery scene and up and coming artists that are available to actually um, get familiar or maybe do a studio visit because that's like an extra way to really understand somebody's process. I don't know, again, if you guys are allowed to follow a hashtag, but I think a lot of artists are, focusing, I should say contemporaries of mine, they're focusing a huge amount of attention on um, Instagram as their primary platform. And I don't know if they're even aware that they can submit to like a literary magazine. I think you guys work with, what's it called? Open call? No, not open call. Um, it's one of those platforms where artists know that there's a call for art. Um, I, I don't know. I just feel like there's other channels other than like open call. I'm just using that as a generic blanket. I'm not sure what you guys were on, but um, I don't know what you're allowed to do, but a little bit of investigative investigative research. I'm sure you would find a lot of gems out there that are just, because artists tend to get really involved in making the work. And some of them are fortunate enough not to have to sell it. They don't, they're not looking to sell it. They're into making it, but they want to publicize it. So they're kind of in that gray zone where maybe they're not submitting. And um, another suggestion I guess I would have is um, letting people know that they might want to go out on a limb and maybe show some of their work that is kind of behind the scenes work when they're submitting. Because I think some artists might feel like I know darn well that it's really weird. And, and Madeline, I was talking about the work from 10 years ago. People love to have work right now in the contemporary world where they can see a face. I don't know what it is. You throw a face in there and it's like, oh, it looks like me or it looks like somebody I know and I can identify with it. Where abstract work, I think people are a little bit um, turned off by because they, they have to articulate it about it emotionally and psychologically. So uh, I don't know um, if that helps, but like there's somebody like my husband, for example, he would never go out of his way to a submit to an, a literary magazine, but yet he has thousands of paintings, you know, so, and he's like on Instagram, but so I don't know if you're, are you guys allowed to go looking for your artists on your own or does it have to be through the cafe? 
we do. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Do. In fact, this session though, we got enough submissions um, and, and I don't want to keep you too long. So I'll just say quickly, we got enough submissions that we didn't solicit any work. Um, we got some really strong submissions and we also got some submissions where people, um, and, and Ken was kind of referring to not, we find that our artists aren't always their best curators. So yeah. what they give us, we can't make sense of. And, but if we see a germ in it, we definitely go to the website. And, and I think that four out of my five artists, we curated our own, <laughs> we curated what we wanted from their website. <laughs> well, they're very lucky that you did that because, um, it's interesting though, galleries can't curate either. Like, I have to tell you, like, I'm, I'm like a, what you still call an emerging artist, but somewhere in my background, I decided to know how to like pair work together and how to install art and how to make a really beautiful display. And a lot of times I will send them maps, like a, like an editorial spread of my work. I'm like, this is how I want it hung 18 inches apart, X, Y, Z. And I, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are passionate about work and, but they're, their experience might be limited or they're only going to their local galleries where everything is kind of a hodgepodge. And if you're involved in like one per, like a lot of the shows that people are submitting for, you're only allowed to submit like two or three pieces and you have to pay like 35 to 50 bucks for that. So I think that might be why artists aren't familiar with pairing their work together. Cause when you have a solo show, it really bridges that gap because all of a sudden, unless the gallerist is coming to your home and picking your work. Like I've even been in a reputable gallery where I go and I show up and I see my work on the wall and I'm like, what the F were they thinking? Like, I would have never done that. Like the pieces are, my work is, has a lot of voice to it. So it needs some space around it. It's not ever intended to be like smushed up against another piece just because like each piece has right now, I was talking about like a lot of texture. There's so much surface texture that it's okay to put like, one piece or two pieces on a really big wall. We don't need 20. And I'm going off in a totally different direction, but just like uh, referring to like artists not being familiar with curating their work. I think a lot of them aren't being subjected to others who know how to curate work. Like I think there's a lot of naive, passionate people who really love and support art communities, especially non-for-profits. You know, they're doing such great work. Um, it's, it, it's a confidence journey too. I think it takes confidence to know what to pair together and um, it's kind of like when you put together your jewelry or your outfit, you know, like you might keep it simple and just put all turquoise on. Like, I'm going turquoise today. Um, but there is times where, yeah, you just have to see what works that um, links together in ways that might not seem traditional, but then you realize you can link them together because there are elements that um, are really strong. They might be more of a whisper in the background, but when they're set up, you can start to see them interweaving and coming forward. It's amazing, really. Um, Thank you. So uh, let's see, we've made it to um, kind of the end of our half hour. Um, yeah, we went over. Lecture. <laughs> no, we love it. Thank you. Okay. Um, but we uh, um, will respect everybody's time and let them go. So I'll um, stop the recording. Thank you so much for being here, Paula. We Thank you all it. so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yes. Thank you. All right. Bye.